Cambodian Broadcasting Network. Welcome, Lisa. Welcome to the Khmer program. And thank you for taking some time off on your busy schedule on this upcoming election. Thank you. Chumrip Sur, thank you for having me on the program today. I'm really excited to be here. Chumrip Sur. Um, so I would like to start off uh, with, I guess, um, if you would like to explain to the Khmer listeners of what is democracy, what is a democratic society, as it, as it is very new for Cambodia. Cambodia held its first election, first free election in 1993, and it now has been 20 years, it hasn't been very free. Australia is a true democratic country, so please explain to us what it really means. Um, having visited Cambodia late last year and spoke, speaking to some of the opposition parties there, it made me very mindful of the privilege of being in Australia, which is a more mature democracy. Is, but democracy is still a new form of governance compared to many other ways of governing over thousands of years of the Earth and millions of years of the Earth's history. I think in Australia, for me, growing up here, I'm in my mid-40s, I've always... I was excited when I turned 18 to have the right to vote and have a say in governance whether it was a local government area or state government or federal, I've always had an interest in having my say and my right to have a say, but that's a privilege that the more I've travelled overseas, the more I've realised that not everyone has that privilege automatically. You only have to look at the Thai uh, situation at the moment where people have been fighting for their mm. right to vote and politicians like myself have been shot by just electioneering. and. Um, and I know in Cambodia there are stories that I've heard of, of people who have been intimidated and feel like their voices have not been heard fully. And whilst the UN and the Australian government has been involved in, in Cambodia's history in the past, I still believe there are many more people who want to see Cambodia's democracy mature to more like Australia's democracy, where we, we don't take it for granted as we do in Australia sometimes. I get people who come to visit me in my office sometimes who think it's a pain to vote every four years where I think it's a privilege and a right that you must value and fight for and I know many Cambodians have fought for that over the history of the nation, modern history of Cambodia as a nation. Thank you. <clears throat> so as a MP for Taylor I have noticed that the majority of the ethnic community in your electorates uh, majority of them are of Cambodian background. Is that is that correct? We have uh, Cambodians, we have uh, Laotian, Vietnamese, Greek and Italians, uh, Filipino community. About one in it's about twenty six percent of most homes in my electorate in the north of Adelaide have someone from another country and another language spoken, and that gives us an incredible richness and multicultural community that we live in and it's something that I treasure and enjoy um, and I know you and I have met at Cambodians yeah. events and I really enjoy yeah. visiting the pagodas and stupas in the area and working with the monks and the communities there but I also vi visited Vietnam late last year okay. and I learnt more about their form of Buddhism as well. Um, it's a rich and amazing tapestry and, and I really want everyone to come to Australia and share the breadth of their cultural experience with us but I'm very fond of the Cambodian people in my area. Okay. Y you've uh, mentioned that 26%, is that 20 26% of the... Population have some overseas, someone born overseas. Oh, okay, yep, yep. And in your electorate, how many, what, what is the total population of the your okay. your con con constituents and Cam... But Cambodian background and how many? 24,500 people roughly in the electorate. Sorry. It's 24,500 people roughly in the electorate and it's about 400 Cambodians, 400 odd Cambodians that are on the electoral roll. Oh. That doesn't include people who are um, not on the electoral roll because they might not have done their citizenship yet or 
things like that. But certainly if the Cambodian community is active and vibrant in, in Taylor, you've, I think I've got, we've got the Salisbury Road Temple, we've got the Burton Road Temple, we've got another temple at, at Macdonald Park, um, and often we see the monks travelling across all of those spaces to help and support each other. And yeah, it's yeah. pretty special. And I see them in the schools. I see the kids at the schools that I've seen at the temple and we all wave to each yeah. other. And there's a good sense of um, connectedness. Yeah. Yes, I, I have noticed that um, you're quite involved in the Cambodian community and that's, that's very nice, very, very meaningful to all the uh, Cambodians, all the Cambodian community. Um, so being a, an MP for Taylor itself, does that mean you are re representing them in a parliament of South Australia? And so for the Cambodian community itself, mm. what action have you taken to assist uh, to solve their issues? Because I'm sure there are plenty of issues in the absolutely. Cambodian community itself. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, uh, one of the temples, for example, was paying land tax when it didn't need to, so we helped them get a land tax rebate and ensure that the tax bill for the temple was no longer there. So that helped the community do other good acts with aged care and things like that. Um, sometimes it's translating documents. Um, I'm blessed to have um, Sakia, who's a volunteer of Cambodian background, who's a student at Flinders Uni, who helps me. Uh, we've done some phone canvassing with the Khmer population and often they might not come to the front door of the office not knowing that ha they can seek help with us. So by phone canvassing we do outreach but I've also tried to ensure that where possible we do translations, we do um, Cambodian New Year cards so that their um, cultural traditions and values have, are, are recognised. Um, we've tried to make our front um, counter, we've put the Cambodian flag up, some Buddhist symbols up so that people know that this is a safe place that they can come mm -hmm. and, and know that we're, we welcome them and that we will try and give them support both linguistically with translations but also the paperwork because sometimes when English isn't your first mother t tongue, it's confusing paperwork and and we do help them with migration paperwork as well because they want to have family reunions and there's marriages that happen and there's relatives and carers we have to deal with those things as well as school problems roads and the normal state government things yeah i think um you've already answered my next question so i'll, I'll skip the, this uh, question that um so we'll, we'll go to the next question um so uh what can cambodian community do to assist your work as an MP, um, what and what contribution should Cambodian community continue to make, you know, to make Australia the most livable country in this modern and changing world? Mm. Yeah. Um, first of all, to go back to your theme about democracy, um, with the state government looming, the state election coming up is to participate in democracy, to have voice their say. That's really important because if people don't tell me what they want, it's very hard for me to know. I'm not a mind reader. I wish I had superman powers, but I don't. Um, people often ask me to solve problems and I say I don't have a fairy magic wand. But So I like to have a conversation and get to know what's important to them. So some of the things that we've worked on with the Cambodian community is, yes, the cost of living, the normal household problems that some people face but sometimes it's making sure that they have the multicultural grants support. Um, I know that we've recently had a federal government change and some multicultural grants were cut and that particularly affected the Salisbury um, temple and that was very disappointing to them and I'm sad for them in that respect. I know that um, I've gone to a rally on the steps of Parliament House and my office helped um, secure the permission to use the steps of Parliament House for the pro-democracy rally that was last year mm -hmm. and um, we've talked about assistance in tabling petitions and helping some of the monks with their visa problems as well. Um, so those challenges as people tell them we take them on a case-by-case -case basis and in doing that we're fostering the Cambodian community to be a happy healthy place but we're also fostering the community in a broader sense for Taylor because 
a healthy community is one that communicates and and as I said I'm not a mind reader it needs us to be working as a team together to get the best outcomes for all of us. Thank you. Um, now the uh, state election is approaching. I have yesterday I have read the advertiser and um, on there the Labour four year plan. One of them I saw was a, a trade for Southeast Asia. Now is that including Cambodia or if so what trade are we looking at? I think that's something I'll have to get extra information on for you um, because the plan's only just been released but basically the idea is that we will support businesses who want to go and do uh, trade in Southeast Asia. I know in Cambodia there's a growing economy, it's growing very fast, an incredible young population there and when I was there I actually met with some businessmen who are doing collaborative work in the insurance industry in Australia and insurance is a relatively new field in Cambodia for most people so where we can partner with people and businesses in other Southeast Asian areas and that's a prime example. That will be great for Cambodia, it'll grow business, it'll grow relationships and if that business flourishes in Cambodia then it, it's already got plans to talk about going into Burma and other places in that growing. So second tier economies that want to become first and second and move up and we want to provide that good neighbour relationship but it's also good business. Okay. Now let, let's talk about your trip to Cambodia. Yeah. Now I um, last year you made a trip to Cambodia. I um, when was it again? I, I I have forgotten. If you wouldn't mind telling our listeners again, and what was the purpose of the trip? Yeah. Uh, was it a personal one or was it a political one? It was. It was a work trip, and I went in uh, October to Cambodia for four days and, and Vietnam as well. But what I wanted to do is go and understand the history of the country it is such a nearby neighbor to us and because it's a significant part of the population in the north I mean I can go to the temples and participate in New Year's celebrations and things but to understand the story of why people left Cambodia and came to Australia and made their homes here and why they value Australia I really had to go back into your modern history and ancient history as a nation and it Cambodia has an amazing ancient history. So I went to Phnom Penh. Um, I flew in there and I went to see the Sunrise Orphanage at Phnom Penh and visit. And it was on at the end of the Ancestors Day weekend. Yes. So I got to meet some of the uh, some of the orphans that were still left in the Phnom Penh um, site. Um, I also went to uh, Siem Reap mm. and across to Batambang. And I visited Chemnath, who became a monk recently at the Burton Row, well, last year at the, at the Burton Row thing, and I went to the, his um, ordination. So I went to visit his abbot, and I met some Buddhist nuns for the first time, which was truly amazing, because I hadn't run across any of those in Australia. So there was a lady from Melbourne, a lady from London, a lady from California. And the day that I flew into Siem Reap, it was the monsoon season, it was flooding. We were very, very lucky to get across to Badambang near the Thai border. Uh, the road was flooded. The rice farmers were facing some really difficult situation because if the rice fields are flooded for too long, they lose their harvest. Yes. So for me to understand the challenges in their lives and what you've come from was really important. So they were fishing by the side of the road with little nets trying yeah. to get what they it could. <laughs> and then we were going along the potholes and the infrastructure um, I learned about, I, I met some of the opposition leaders in Phnom Penh as well. Um, I went to the monastery, then I went to a um, Savon Lee's um, family at Badambang and I had a, a tea with them. I had sat on the floor and talked and their house had been flooded the day before and we went across the bricks into their yard because the house is a little bit above the yard with the water yes. and sat down and ate with them and met their grandchildren and his brother and understood their perspective. His son was there from Phnom Penh and he's a university lecturer and I was sitting there talking about my volunteer Sakia Ray and I said oh I've been to visit this ACE Leadership Academy in Phnom Penh which helps farming students who are at university and he knew Ray. I, he said oh, I know this person I think I've been to his wedding and then he gets out Facebook and there's Sakia and I'm on the other side of the world and they're are two people who know the person I know who volunteers in my office and we didn't know there was that connection so 
in my life at the moment, I keep running across Cambodia. It's, it's sort of like there's a message there that I have a connectedness to Cambodia, yeah. which is a little bit Buddhist in a way, you yes, know, like there's, yeah. a, there's a message. Um, we went back to Siem Reap last, that night. We are very lucky to get back in. So it was like an 18-hour day. And then we met with a, a lass who is in Tara Winkler's, does some community work there too with children at risk, and they've got some shelters. So we talked... Tara Winkler's? Winkler. Oh, it's Winkler. Winkler. Yeah, and she heard her worker Daisy and I sat down and chatted about the challenges in there because um, I have an interest in in making sure that children aren't trafficked and that's one of the reasons I've been to Sunrise as well because you have such a young population there and I'd also heard some stories um, about organ trafficking as well mm. and so making sure that those things in the state parliament there may be some things where I can stand up and talk on behalf of the community um, just as I've spoken about the Cambodian community in, in my last four years, yeah. I hope to be able to do that in the future to, to highlight some of the issues important to them. Then we went back to Phnom Penh and did some more work around Phnom Penh and visited the killing field sites. And I thought there was just one killing field site, but when you travel around Cambodia, you realise that everyone has a story of loss. Everyone has lost someone, if not multiple people. Yeah. And it's recent history. It doesn't matter where you go. There's 600 sites like that around sure. Cambodia. And the Jewish Holocaust was a terrible thing. But yeah. when you think about the size and enormity of that period in Cambodia's history with Pol Pot and Khmer Rouge, it's, I don't think Westerners truly understand why, why you're a diaspora community in Australia, why you fled and why you couldn't stay. Yeah because people starved to death, people were tortured, people were maimed and killed and just disappeared and they still do not know where their family members are. And mm -hmm. so it was a work um, trip, but personally it was very um, moving as well. I also went to Angkor Wat quickly for two hours to understand that I'm a student of ancient history at oh, high school. Oh, okay. So for me to see that, that was quite amazing as a as a complex i feel like i only scratched the surface of that yeah. and so i'd like to i work. yeah i want to go back yeah. Yeah. yeah so the nuns have said come and stay with me a few days and i'd like to go back in the future and maybe spend a few days with them as a retreat i want to go down to see to visit the hiv um, aids um, sunrise site yeah. that's new that they're doing some wonderful the australian cambodian um, association i've become a mem becoming a member of that yeah. and I want to support that Sunrise group doing that. Um, one of Temple Christian College um, at Paralawi, they do a regular trip there. It's this sort of, they go to Cambodia every year. So there's many people I know that are doing good things in rebuilding Cambodia and as a nearby neighbour, I think we could do more as a state, but as a country, we need to support the growth of Cambodia into a mature democracy. Sure. Now, Sunrise is managed by Geraldine Cox, is that correct? Yeah, and some people in Adelaide, John George. Um, I was at Government House last year and he got an OAM for his work with Cambodia. He's been the treasurer of Sunrise for 15 years so yeah. and they helped fundraise for that. So Geraldine started it, but there's a board and Adelaide is very much connected to that yeah, yeah. and there's students that are study at some of the private schools here and they come for medical treatment. One of the days last year when I visited the Burton Road Temple, there was a young boy who just arrived yeah. and he was coming here for some treatment and I met some of the other girls who are doing further studies here. I think it's really important that we invest in the inskilling of everyone in Cambodia and if Australia can provide some educational support with that so that they can, can go back home and become young leaders in the nation's future, that's incredibly valuable. Um, certainly, uh, can we pause for a sec? No, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking of the other place that I went to in Phnom Penh that was educational. Oh yeah, I w went to Wat San, the slum. And that's where Sakia's ACE Attitude Leadership Academy. Yeah, what then? It's close to the in, close to the centre of um, Phnom Penh. It's a temple. Isn't yeah, it's a Wat stupa. Wat it's Wat I think maybe Wat Tan. Wat Tan, yeah. yeah Wat it's a stupa, yeah. and we went in and saw the children, 
And do you want to get the little booklet that they gave me? It's on the bookshelf in there. And they yeah. they had been learning English with the charity and the capacity to learn English is a great employment advantage for them to be able to work. Yes, yeah. So what happens is the children from the rural towns that are doing university studies, for them to be in the dorms, it's sort of a it's a good story of they help the other children to learn English while they're learning further studies at university. So it's good karma. Yeah. It's a good circle. And so I was privileged to see them perform and dance and talk to them. And, and they made me this little book um, about Cambodia. That they've all written special things in it. Yeah, and okay. so it's sort of on my bookshelf. It's a treasured thing. They've all written their story about how old they are and how oh, long they've been learning yeah. English. And yeah. it's, really, it's really good. And it was important for why why they're learning Khmer and English, learning to read and write, and really, and, and very writing, and writing. Yeah, yeah. How, how fantastic. How old are the kids? All sorts of ages. This girl's fourteen, oh. but these are children. His this one's ten. That's pretty okay, good quality. So, um, mm. as a mum with a ten-year-old, I don't think my daughter's writing is that tidy. <laughs> <laughs> She's trying hard, but it was really meaningful that I got to meet. I mean, you can go on these parliamentary trips and meet official people. For, for, for me to meet families firsthand in their homes and yeah. understand their story and to move amongst the lives of ordinary people there as a visitor, not as an official, yeah. was very important to me and dear to my heart. I want to go back. Yeah. Amazing. Sounds like a very amazing story, Lisa. It was fantastic. Yeah. It was an amazing time. Busy, now, busy, but good. Yeah. Now, um, I believe you met a few of the CNRP prominent opposition leaders mm -hmm. uh, during this trip, such as Musa Khor and Son Chai. Son Chai, he's actually from Adelaide. Yes, I he's, know. Um, another connection to Adelaide. Yeah. So... Um, I didn't meet Musa Khor. She No, you didn't no, meet Musa We were scheduled to see Musa Khor, but there were protests around that time and we didn't... We were scheduled to meet Musa Khor, but unfortunately she didn't make it to the hotel destination, but I did meet... Sunshine. Yeah, Sunshine. Yeah. And I follow them on Facebook now. Yeah. So I get to see what's there. But sometimes the Facebook gets edited. Yeah. And I it's not I know there's Khmer, but this is like the Facebook seems to get edited out. Okay. But I do follow both of them and some other Cambodian people now on Facebook so I understand more about what's happening and we talked about maturing the relationship and democracy together and yes, they have an amazing connection to Adelaide. He studied yes. here at Flinders. He, right. he helped start the Cambodian um, Association of South Australia, right. which um, we still help today. We help Danny and Frank and all of those people sort some of the things they're going through. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, another I, part of this Cambodian story. <laughs> I, I, I was going to ask you to, um, to compare the two. I mean, um, now that you haven't met Musa Kaur, so I'll just ask about... I've met her in Adelaide. You have? You have met her? Yeah. Okay, I so um, I, I met her. I met her at a New Year celebration year before last. Okay. Uh, now, would you see them? Uh, uh, which one would be a good candidate as a foreign prime minister if CNRP w uh, was in power? Um, which one would you say, Musa Kaur or Sun Chai? Oh, that's a hard <laughs> question. <laughs> so, are you talking about being a foreign minister or a prime minister? Um. I think they'd yeah, both be. They'd be. I yeah. think they'd be both. I think they'd make great leaders in a team in government. Okay. I wouldn't want to pick one as for which of those roles. I I think Sanche is a diplomat yes. naturally, so I think he's fairly adapt adept at being an international person and doing that work. And certainly, he did some work with Kevin Rudd when he was in foreign affairs about building democracy in Southeast Asia. That's right. um, but he's very, very passionate about um, Cambodia and democracy and understands our connection to Adelaide very well. Musuku, um, she's a very compassionate woman from the time I met her at the two temples here for New Year's celebrations. Yeah. And she seems very much, um, very much focused on um, when I see her at rallies and things like that. So I think they have different skill sets, but they're, they're both very remarkable people. Yeah. Um, now let's talk about Mr. Hun San for a bit. In your view, now Hun San, um, 
and his party came to power 35 years ago. He was a, a Khmer Rouge communist army commander. And in 1993, after the UN held a free election, mm. and in 1997, he overthrew the legitimate government. And now, today, it seems like he's trying to hang on to the power. So how do you see his leadership? And also, do you think change will come to Cambodia? When you're in Cambodia, it's interesting that um, people are hesitant at first to talk about politics because they're scared they're being watched or they're very aware of government presence where, well, when I'm in the street here, if someone doesn't like my brand of politics, they'll just yell at me or shout at me. Or I think the recent um, union protests about fair wages and things. I mean, I come from a labour background and uh, when I work with the National Union of Workers with the chicken workers dispute, um, people, a fair wage for a fair day's work is an incredibly important but basic human right and the textile workers had to fight for that in Cambodia recently so I found that very perturbing. I think the government there has been there for a long time and I think there's a mounting feeling within the Cambodian community for people I ran into that they're scared to say they want change but they're growing in confidence and I think change is coming and I don't think it's very far away and the elections last year there were people who felt they weren't fair and they were being challenged. Um, they still weren't finalised when I was there and I think people feel that that democracy is coming but it takes some very brave people to take take that change on. And sometimes it's intimidating both physically, but also to the broader community. But I think there is a mounting pressure in Cambodia that is going to change the way the government works there in the long term. Democracy ebbs and flows, and that's a good thing and a bad thing. It's bad when you're on the kicking out end, but if you're in the going in and you want to do positive change, that's fair. And that's no one person can hold the leadership of a country forever. Mm -hmm. That is not just or right. Thank you. No. <laughs> that's, that's why right. I mentioned the petition before. Yeah. That we yeah. need to. Until I went, I didn't realise. Until I went, I, I knew we'd been involved as a little girl growing up with that period, but. There were things I learnt when I was in Cambodia where I felt slightly ashamed that Australia didn't take a stronger stand at the time. We were complicit. I think Gareth Evans tried to fix some things up, but mm. we need to be better neighbours and we need to be mentors of good democracy. That's my personal view. That's yeah. not a party view. For me, I feel that Australia didn't finish their job when we started. And that's... that's what I and my friend and I, as we travelled around, she and I both reached a similar agreement that we half did our work there. Yeah. And um, I felt embarrassed as an Australian citizen that we didn't. Yeah. So maybe that's one of the reasons I feel a sense of obligation now. And like I said, democracy, to me, I've grown up with it thinking it's just my right. Yeah. My Cambodian friends, it's not a novelty. It's a basic human right. Thank you. Now, um, I think we um, have a bit for the last question. I have a couple of minutes for the last question, I, I guess, a few minutes. Um, the state election is on the way. I have seen many of your beautiful posters on the street. <laughs> um, I've been now, when, <laughs> when is it on? And, uh, and what are your messages to the Cambodian? community on the election day. Okay. Um, the fixed term election for South Australia is on the 15th of March, that's a Saturday. Um, polling booths are open between 8 and 6pm. Um, I'll be certainly uh, doing my best to communicate with the Cambodian community. Um, we plan to do some Khmer how to vote cards, so we'll have some translations if people need assistance. Mm -hmm. Um, they'll be able to get advice about where they can do a pre-poll vote or they can come onto the booth on the day. We'll be wearing bright 
yellow t-shirts with red, um, sort of traditional Cambodian colours um, and Vietnamese colours, and it's a yellow that we've been using for a long time. So yeah, okay. you can Very see nice. me there, yeah. those colours, and we've got Lisa Listens t-shirts. So, um, But I need people to tell me what they want and how I can help them as well. So. Um, I've been honoured to work with the community for four years and I, am, I, I, I hope they give me the privilege of representing them for another four years because it's something I'm very passionate about and I love. Yes, so that I won't do any more politics than that. Let my actions stand for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much for your time. Hope to interview you again uh, sometime in the future. Thank you so Thank much, you. Dara. Thank you, Dara. Um, Onkun <laughs> Chira. Five EDI FM. We're going to be talking with Maker.